Welcome to the iPad Podcast, a weekly podcast from Max Future. Okay. Okay, welcome to episode 75 of the iPad Podcast. This is Lex at MaxFuture.com, and today is October 9th, 2011. Well, it's been a very eventful week. Um, two very significant things happened uh, in Apple News that do affect the iPad. The first, which came on Tuesday, was that Apple announced the launch of the iPhone 4S and the Im- imminent launch of iOS 5, and that will have an effect on the iPad, and I'll go into that a little later in the podcast. And of course, the sadder thing, the very sad thing happened the next day, which is Apple announced that Steve Jobs has died. And it's very sad because obviously Steve Jobs you know, was the heart and soul of Apple and was just an incredible innovator and has done so much. And this is an iPad show, but since he was so instrumental in the iPad, I think we should talk about Steve Jobs and what he really has meant. So let's uh, start the podcast. Here we go. Well, Steve Jobs died on October 5th at the age of 56, very young. Remember, he was born in 1955. And, you know, he had, I think, profound influence on millions and millions of people, if not over a billion people. He was compared, he is being compared to Thomas Edison and other incredibly influential industrialists and inventors. And he was a little bit of everything, if you think about it. He was uh, obviously a corporate leader. He was an entrepreneur and startup genius. Remember, he started with practically nothing, him and Steve Wozniak, in the garage, his dad's garage. Um, He was also, you know, an entertainer. He entertained us with his incredibly gifted and powerful presentations using Keynote He knew how to run what's a PowerPoint presentation. We'll call it a keynote presentation because that's the software he used. He was also a magician of some sort. You know, um, he loved to surprise us and he loved to bring magic to us because in a lot of ways, the technology that he produced was like magic. At the time he gave us something, it was like the future, something we hadn't really you know, something we may have dreamed about, but something that we didn't think would really come into our lives this quickly. You know, from the first Macintosh or the first Apple and the Apple II computer to the iPod. Uh, Yeah, there were MP3s before the iPod, but the iPod was something I really had dreamed about. Like, you know, why why can I only put 12 songs or a dozen songs or 100 songs on an MP3 player? Wouldn't it be great? If we had an MP3 player with massive storage and I could buy music digitally and store all my music. And then, of course, you know, the thing that's the heart of this show, the iPad. I mean, he really, there had been tablets before the iPad. There had been, you know, Microsoft and Windows had been trying to get their partners to do to do um, tablets for years. And there were in the corporate world certain certain tablets, but they were kind of clumsy and funky and too expensive. And Steve Jobs in 2010 unveiled the first iPad. And we were all shocked, really, that the cheapest one was only $499. Uh, And, you know, he just was incredible and of course he started Pixar or he 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 really tra- he ran Pixar he owned it and it became it transformed digital animation you know toy story all that great stuff uh, and of course he founded the next computer company after he was kicked out of Apple the internet was invented or started uh, the world wide web on a next computer in Switzerland so, you know, it's a it's a tragic loss, tragic in the sense that he was only 56. He could have lived if he had been healthy and didn't get cancer. 
He could have lived, you know, some people live into their 80s or 90s. Imagine what the world is going to be missing out on because he died at the age of 56. You know, God knows what kind of creations uh, he would have had going forward. Now, the thing is, it's not like he was a scientist. It's not like he was in a laboratory, like, you know, coming up with uh, scientific breakthroughs. In a lot of ways, what Steve Jobs' genius was, uh, was in identifying cutting-edge technology that was in the laboratory, if not Apple's laboratory, other people's laboratories, and, and figuring out a way to take that cutting-edge technology and commercialize it and make a product that was a leap ahead of all the other products that were out there. But it wasn't just making the product that was a leap ahead. What he had perfected by the end of his life was coming out with something that was not only technically advanced, but also priced at a price that people could obtain that product or technology, and also making it beautiful. So he brought all these things together. That was his, and he obviously he knew how to collect the best and brightest around him and manage him, manage them, and come out with the product on a mass level. Because sure, there are people in laboratories who, you know, are making all sorts of breakthroughs, but it's not enough to make a breakthrough in technology. You then have to take that technology, find how to humanize it, how to make a product, and find a way to make a product that can be sold and distributed at a mass level so that you know millions and hundreds of millions of people in the world can get it. And I think that was his genius. His genius was in one way to bring the future to us quicker than it would normally come. Yeah, the future is going to come eventually. Technologies, people doing the research in the lab, the scientists, they're eventually going to bring the future to us. But what Steve Jobs was able to do is identify the technology, see what its impact would have on the future, and find a way to accelerate the future coming to us. Because, look, everybody... Everybody dreamed, has dreamed about a tablet device before the iPad came out. I mean, I remember when e-ink was first pioneered at MIT. You know, e-ink is the technology <clears throat> that um, the Kindle, the first Kindles used. I remember when e-ink first came out and, um, you know, I had interesting thoughts about it. So my interesting thoughts on e-ink when it first came out was that, look, one day we're definitely going to have really, really paper-thin devices that look just like paper but are electronic. They're going to be flexible. You're going to be able to read them in the sunlight. They're going to be just as thin as maybe the thinnest magazine or some thin piece of paper, but they're going to be sturdy. They're going to have vibrant colors, and I think we're going to head to that day. But the beauty is we're, we're getting there in part because of Apple. If Apple hadn't really come forth with the iPad as a mass production device, we wouldn't be getting there as quickly as we can because that's what Apple does. Apple doesn't invent technology. Apple looks at technology that's in the lab, that's you know in the, in the component industry, and thinks of a way that it can take that technology, bring it to the masses, and leap ahead and really bring the future a little quicker to us. And that that's what makes Apple stay ahead. So, um, anyways, I think Apple's profound impact and Steve Jobs' profound impact has been that, among other things, really bringing the future to us quickly. But I wrote another blog post today that I think is about the iPad, but also about the future. But I'll get to that shortly. Now, right before Steve Jobs died, 
Apple had an event. It had its iPhone event. It wasn't an iPad event, but it was an iPhone event, and it was on October 4th, 2011, a Tuesday. And I do think it has relevance for the iPad. Here's why. Apple basically unveiled what iOS 5 is really going to look like. And we've already seen a lot of what's going to be in iOS 5. And I think last week I went through a lot of the features in iOS 5. But Apple unveiled an, a new feature of iOS 5 that's going to be in the iPhone 4S. And the iPhone 4S, just quickly in case you didn't listen to my other podcast, is essentially the same body as the iPhone. And that's got a lot of people bummed. But it shouldn't because the iPhone is a beautiful device. But the key thing about the iPhone 4S, which we sort of anticipated, is it's going to have the same fast, advanced processor, the dual core, uh, the dual core A5 processor that's in the iPad 2. It's also going to have a much better camera than the iPhone 4, an 8 megapixel camera. And it's going to have a universal cell phone chip. So it's going to be able to run on Verizon. It's going to be able to run on AT&T. And now it's going to also be on Sprint in the United States, all off the same chip. So Apple doesn't have to make different devices for different carriers. Rather, it makes one device, and it can run on GSM and CDMA, which are the main two cell phone technologies. So, But Apple unveiled something new that's in the iPhone 4S. It's not going to run on the regular iPhone. And it's a new voice, it's a voice recognition and artificial, artificial intelligence uh, service that's built into the operating system. And it's called Siri, and Apple claims it's in beta. Now, Siri was an app. There was a voice recognition, sort of an artificial intelligence app that came out a couple of years ago. But Apple now has incorporated that into the operating system, and it works only on the iPhone 4S, presumably because it has a fast enough processor. And basically, it's very cool. Siri, um, you talk to the phone, and it recognizes what you're saying, even in like difficult ambient noise situations. But then you have a conversation with the phone. It asks you questions. It tells you stuff. And... Um, you know, this is key because it's almost like a robot. And now Apple didn't say anything about this coming to the iPad 2. And I would think it would work on the iPad 2 because the iPad 2 has an A5 processor also. But Apple didn't say how much RAM the iPhone has. And it may be that the iPhone 4S has one megabyte of RAM. The uh, iPad 2 only has 512 megabytes of RAM. So maybe that's the difference. But it's going to be a profound... Obviously, this technology is eventually going to come to the iPad. If it's not coming to the iPad 2, it's going to come to the iPad 3. And we're eventually going to see this. This is going to be more and more important in computing voice recognition and the ability for us to converse and give vocal instructions to our iPhone is going to become more and more important and the same for the iPad. You're going to be able to instruct your iPad what to do. And there's already some voice recognition in the current operating system. It's an accessibility feature, particularly for the disabled. But what Apple announced on October 4th, the day Steve Jobs died, is that they're taking it a step up. That This is going to be really smart voice recognition and smart artificial intelligence. And if you think about this, this is really important to the history of computers. And here's a post that I wrote that really says it. Okay, so here's a post that I wrote yesterday that really, I think, gives you a perspective about when Steve Jobs died and what was so significant about what happened the day before. And I entitled it, Steve Jobs Died Right After He Unleashed the Fourth Paradigm of personal computing. As you probably know, Steve Jobs died on October 5th, 2011, the day after Apple launched the iPhone 4S. At least one source said that the day before he died, while gravely ill, 
Steve Jobs was able to watch a video feed of Apple's event to reveal the iPhone 4S. What m many people don't realize is that Steve Jobs got to live to see himself usher in the fourth paradigm change on personal computing. Altogether, Steve Jobs was responsible for ushering in four paradigm changes in personal computing. What do I mean by that? Here are the four paradigms. Paradigm one, the personal computer. Apple Computer was launched on April 1st, 1976 by Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, and Ronald Wayne. The Apple I and Apple II computers began the age of the personal computer. Prior to then, computers were not really something individuals owned. Instead, they were large, clunky, mainframe computers, and you went to a terminal and tried to get some limited time on the behemoths. The Apple II was the first real mass-produced personal computer. While the Altair came out right before the Apple I, that computer was really a hobby kit and was very difficult to program. The Apple II was a disk drive, with a disk drive was the first personal computer to really become a consumer product. Steve Jobs, along with Steve Wozniak, ushered in the personal computer age, and thus the first paradigm of personal computing. Paradigm 2, the graphical user interface and mouse. After ushering in the personal computer, Steve Jobs realized computing was still not accessible enough to make it an appliance for everyday people. Today, we all are used, used to the graphical user interface, the GUI, i.e. windows and icons which you can click to run programs. But back in the day of the Apple I and Apple II, there were no graphical user interfaces in computing, nor any mouses. At Xerox's research center in California, researchers were pioneering the concept of a GUI to make it easy for everyday people to compute. In exchange for Apple stock, Xerox allowed Steve Jobs and Apple to look around the Xerox Research Center for three days. Jobs saw the Xerox researchers experimenting with the graphical user interface, and he realized that that was the future of computing. Personal computers needed to, to be easy to use, and a metaphor, windows and icons with a mouse control, was a better way to initiate calculations and run programs. Steve Jobs took the concepts at Xerox's research center and implemented them in the Lisa and Macintosh computers. The Macintosh computer, launched in 1984, ushered in the second paradigm of personal computing, computing through a graphical user interface and a mouse. Reviewers in initially thought Apple and Steve Jobs were crazy. They thought the mouse was a joke. The Macintosh and its operating system and mouse caused Apple's competitors to follow suit. Several years after the Macintosh came out, Microsoft abandoned its MS-DOS operating system and brought out Windows as an operating system for PCs. The rest is history. Paradigm 3. Touch computing. Well, the graphical user interface and mouse computing paradigm has lasted for a long time. In fact, at present, at work and at home, most people still do computing in the graphical user interface and mouse computing form. That is, we either have a PC or a Macintosh. In 2007, Apple and Steve Jobs ushered in a new paradigm in computing, touch computing. The iPhone launch in 2007 brought touch computing to the masses. Each iteration of the iPhone has changed computing as consumers are getting exposed to a new way through touching icons and apps on a screen. In 2010, Apple and Steve Jobs further touch computing by launching the iPad. In 2011, Apple and Steve Jobs took it to another level with the iPad too. Both products, like the iPhones, have been fantastic successes for Apple. Touch computing has made it easier for consumers to compute. But where will computing go? What is the fourth paradigm? Paradigm four, voice controlled artificial intelligence. On October 4th, 2011, Apple ushered in the fourth paradigm of personal computing with the launch of the iPhone 4S. Many commentators failed to appreciate the significance of the event. 
Some said Apple's October 4th event was a non-event, as the iPhone 4S has the same body style as the iPhone 4. But what critics failed to realize is that one special feature in the iPhone 4S really ushers in a new paradigm in personal computing. Apple has the Siri function built into the operating system. Siri was the voice recognition app that Apple purchased a few years ago. But an iPhone 4S Siri is built into the operating system and can work with any application that takes advantage of it. And by all reports, it's not just a voice recognition like the kind that exists already in Android devices. Siri is a smart voice recognition that understands the context of what you say. Most significantly, Siri takes, take, talks back to you and can ask you questions. This type of voice recognition and artificial intelligence is the future of personal computing. Touch computing will seem quaint and graphical user interface and mouse computing will be ancient when we compute by talking to our computers. Imagine it. We will have conversations with our iPhone. Other devices will also have voice recognition and artificial intelligence. We will walk into a room and talk instructions to a TV or a dishwasher or other devices. The fourth stage of computing means we will have smart robots that talk to us. Is it a coincidence that Steve Jobs died the day after October, after the October 4th event? I think Steve Jobs fully realized the significance of the launch of the iPhone 4S and willed himself to live to see it. Steve Jobs fully understood that he brought personal computing to its next stage, the fourth paradigm, voice recognition with our artificial intelligence. Okay, so one of the curious things about the iPhone 4S, and maybe this was the case also with the original iPhone, is that at full price, the iPhone 4S costs more than an iPad 2. In other words, you can buy the iPhone 4S without a subsidy, and that means you're not locked into a plan. But I noticed that there's a, a weird price difference. In other words, that the iPhone 4S costs actually a little more than an iPad 2. <clears throat> Um, the iPhone 4S comes in the same three sizes of storage as the iPad, 16 gigabytes, 32 gigabytes, and 64 gigabytes. But the iPhone 4S is $20 more across the line than the iPad 2. At 16 gigabytes, the iPhone 4S is $649 to the iPad 2, the 3G version, costing $629. Same for the 32 gigabyte versions. $749 to $729, and the 64 gigabyte version, $849 for the iPhone 4S and $829 for the iPad 3G in that size. Now you may wonder why the iPhone 4S is more expensive than the iPad 2. After all, the iPad has a much bigger screen and the screen has to be much more expensive than the iPhone's three and a half inch screen. It could be that the iPhone 4 has, has more expensive components than the iPad, which, um, which, you know, surpasses the cost difference in the screens. For example, the iPhone 4S has a much better camera on the back side. The iPad 2 has a three megapixel camera. While the iPad 2, well, the iPhone uh, has a 8 megapixel camera. Also, the optics in the cameras for the iPhone 4S, 4S are significantly better. Also, the iPhone 4S has a cell phone, has cell phone chips and antennas that allow the same model to run on Verizon, AT&T, and Sprint. This makes the iPhone 4S a world phone. The iPad 2, the 3G version, has more simple cell shells cell chips and antenna dedicated to either the CDMA network or GSM, not both. It is not a world iPad. It, w it could be that there are significant price differences in these components that justify the higher iPhone 4 cost. Also, other components may be more expensive on the iPhone than the iPad because they have to be smaller to fit into the iPhone. Anyways, that's my observation. Now, in terms of the Siri voice recognition coming to the iPad 2, the unofficial Apple weblog at TUAW.com had similar thoughts to me that, that the Siri will come to 
iPad 2. Uh, this is what they say. They say, since the iPad 2 has both a microphone and the same A5 as the iPhone 4S, there shouldn't be any technical reason why Siri wouldn't function well on that device. Some have speculated that the iPhone 4S has one gigabyte of RAM to the iPad 2's 512 megabytes, a claim that we will have to wait for an iFixit teardown before it can be proven or disproven. But, but it goes on to say, but my TUAW colleagues don't believe that Siri's functions should be so RAM intensive that they may require such massive amounts of memory. And they make a very interesting observation in that blog. It says, in fact, we've done some digging into Siri and found that most of the actual work of understanding voice commands gets offloaded to external servers. In essence, the iPhone 4S and its built-in processing functions determine what you said while Apple's servers translate that into what you meant and send that information back to your iPhone. The pre-processing that takes place on the device itself may be too taxing for an A4 processor, but the iPad 2's A5 should theoretically be able to handle it just fine. It goes on to say perhaps even better, Apple has a habit of underclocking CPUs for the iPhone in the interests of power management, so the, A5, Apple, so the iPad 2's A5 is likely to outperform that of the iPhone 4S for many functions. You know, they also make the observation that maybe Apple is delaying releasing it on the iPad 2. Um, TUAW says, the fact that Apple hasn't yet said one way or another whether Siri will come to devices other than the iPhone 4S also doesn't mean much. The iPhone 4 3GS and newer iPod touch models had an exclusive on multitasking for almost exactly six months before iOS 4.2 debuted and brought that feature to the iPad. And the same thing may end up being true for Siri. So that's a very good point. So they think that Siri will remain an iPhone 4S exclusive uh, at least until the third tier of international rollouts completes in December. And, and then after the holidays, Siri will come to the iPad 2. And um, he goes on to say, not only will this give market incentive for people to buy the iPhone 4S by having Siri on as a ex device exclusive feature bef during the holidays, it'll also give Apple servers and Siri algorithms times to adjust and scale to the number of inquiries it receives. So that, that's true. If, there's a lot of iPad 2s out right now. If you immediately put the Siri beta on the iPad 2, there's going to be just millions and millions of people who are going to be using it. On the other hand, if you put it on the iPhone 4S, it's going to sort of gradually tax the servers. So that's a very, I think that's a very smart observation. Um, so he goes on to say he doesn't think it's going to come to the uh, older iPad or, or the older iOS devices. So, yeah. I, I do think obviously one day we're going to have it on the iPad 2, if not the iPad 3. Now, how important was the iPad to Steve Jobs? Well, the blog or the or the magazine online technology at, at MSNBC on MSN.com had a, has a story out entitled "Jobs iPad: A Culmination of Life's Work," and basically this article by William Ro Wilson Rothman says that really the iPad was, you know, the thing that was the culmination of Steve Jobs' work. And this sort of parallels the thing that I wrote. He starts off by saying, for most people, driving the vanguard of a single revolution would provide enough glory to last a lifetime. For Steve Jobs, the first revolution gave him a taste. It's hard to keep track of all the upheavals that can be attributed to Jobs in music and cell phones and animated film. But history is already labeling the iPad as the culmination, the, uh, the culmination of his life's work. And um, he, he cites Steve Wozniak. He says, according to Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, addressing an engineering conference last April, the iPad was in his mind from the beginning. Yet Jobs was like a painter who must spend decades developing this technique before being able to recreate the visions he sees in his head. 
And he goes on to quote Wozniak saying, uh, quote, I think Steve Jobs had the intention from the day we started Apple, end quote, said Wozniak. Quote, but it was just hard to get there because we had to go through a lot of steps where you connected to things, end quote. So, you know, I think that's very right. I think that Steve Jobs saw the future, the iPad. He was probably dreaming about the iPad back when he started Apple. So I, I agree with that article. Okay, so to really get a sense of how Steve Jobs and the iPad is changing the world, here's an interesting uh, video and article on the Globe and Mail.com. I believe that's a British paper. And apparently the famous art, uh, artist, David Hockney, who's a painter, he's exhibiting his drawings and they're only be shown on Apple devices. In other words, he's not using paper. They're being shown at the Royal Ontario Museum. And uh, let's see, there's a little bit of a video here. And basically, let's see if we can scroll. You know, his, his, his art, the medium for showing it, uh, you know, are the iPad and the iPhone. So don't you think, don't you think in the future, we're just going to have this incredible, vibrant, electronic paper? Uh, I mean, the iPad's going to get thinner. The iPhone's going to get th thinner. If you're looking at this video, I mean, he's got like hundreds of iPhones and iPads on the wall. And that's the gallery. So maybe we'll walk into museums at some point and we'll have digital art everywhere you know, screens and, you know, paper is going to be, paper is going to be something relic, like, you know, like the, you know, in the times the stone age or something like that. So anyways, uh, you know, anybody who has any doubt that the iPad and the iPhone are changing things should take a look at this video. Okay, so in one way, one of the weirdest articles I've seen this week, and also an article that shows how how much the iPad is dominating is an article that I saw on CNET entitled uh, Android Apps to Run on iPad with Alien Dalvec 2.0. And the article is by Lance Whitney on October 7th. And basically, I guess some application came out that helps developers who create apps for the Android market to easily port these apps to run on the iPad. Now there are, you know, there's a lots of tools out there to help people write apps in other code other than Objective-C, which is the native code that Apple wants you to write apps in. For example, PhoneGap, which I guess, I think PhoneGap's open source, but PhoneGap allows you to write something in HTML5 and then use PhoneGap to put it into Xcode and then convert it to an, an, an iPad or an iPhone app. So anyway, so this article shows you how desperate Android developers are to get a bigger market. They want their tablet apps to run on the iPad. It says um, the software comes from some group called the Myriad Group. And they announced on, I guess, October 6th that their software called Alien Dalvik 2.0, that's D-A-L-V-I-K 2.0, will support Android apps on tablets, e-books, TVs, and even cars. And uh, it says that the software allows most Android package, also known as APK files, to run on a myriad of devices with little or no tweaking. Uh, users can simply trigger the APK file to install and launch the app on their chosen device. Now, I can't imagine that's going to look so great on an iPad. I mean, I do think the apps that look the best on the iPad are the ones who that are actually written in native code. But it's interesting that um, that this is happening. It just really shows you how dominant the iPad is, I guess. Now, one of the really pathetic things to happen after Steve Jobs' dead, death was a, an iPad scam. 
Uh, uh, for example, a website called fun47.com reported that uh, there was a Facebook scam that came out this week claiming to give free iPads to users in memory of Steve Jobs, and thousands of users became victims of the scam. It says there were many variants of the scam by many different spammers. Most of them asked people to like their Facebook page or site so they can show update, show update on their wall. Others asked users to copy and post text with links on their wall, group groups, and other pages. When a user clicks on the link, he was redirected to a page asking to complete it, a step to get a free IPA. Those steps were filling out surveys, signing on different sites. So this is really sad. So keep a lookout. You know, uh, there are a lot of scams going around promising free iPads. Nothing's really free. Don't don't fall for any of these scams. And it's shame on you, scammers, for using Steve Jobs' death to try to rip off people. Shame on you. So be careful out there. Okay, so now CNET reported a story on October 7th which uh, I think is the uh, the most gimmicky accessory for the iPad, and in some way it's kind of clever. Amanda Kusher, Kusher had a story called Chopsticks, Chopsticks for iPad, not Sushi. And basically um, there is a company called Epivo, I-P-E-V-O, uh, that has some styluses called Chopsticks. And uh, they're styluses, and I guess you get two, and they look like they look like chopsticks. Um, and it says here, chopsticks <laughs> look like something you'd find at the local Chinese restaurant, wrapped in a paper sleeve. Each style is made from aluminum alloy with a rubber tip and is weighted for balance. Chopsticks come in two lengths and run thirty-four dollars and ninety-five cents and forty-four dollars and ninety-five cents. So, you know, they they look pretty cool. Um, you can apparently use one in each hand, and um, I don't know why you'd use it in, in two, you know, with two hands. They have a picture here showing someone using uh, two stylus, one in left hand, one in the right hand. I guess um, the article says you could use it for iPad virtual drumming. Uh, maybe you could do sort of fake sushi eating off of it. Anyway, it's kind of gimmicky. On the other hand, if you want two styluses for the price of one, although it's pretty expensive, uh, you might want to get it. But it's really clever. I, I think they deserve an A for cleverness and gimmickiness. Very cool. Now, in the past, we've talked about how some airlines are ditching you know, paper charts and paper navigation books for pilots. Um, and that trend seems to be continuing. Uh, the website marketwatch.com has a story out on October 6th that now Boeing, which makes the airline planes, is pitching iPad navigation charts to the airlines. And it says here that Boeing and Company, Boeing and Company is pitching iPad-based navigation charts to airlines as an alternative to carrying volumes of paper manuals and cockpits as a new generation of pilots that is more comfortable with modern gadgets takes to the skies, a company official said, according to MarketWatch. And the quote here that MarketWatch has from uh, someone named Sherry Carberry, the vice president for flight services at Boeing Commercial Aviation Services, is, quote, everybody's looking at it in Asia Nobody's yet pulled the trigger. They're trying to understand the value, trying to close their business case. So that's interesting. I mean, obviously aviation is a very serious field, but more and more we're going to see the iPad penetrating enterprise. Now, iPad p production has been humming along, and, and we don't seem to be in any short supply of the iPad 2. Um, and it's mainly made in China by Foxcom, and there had been some hope for the iPad 2 to also be made somewhere else. And one place in particular that supposedly was going to be soon being made in is Brazil, down under, which would also help in distribution in Brazil, which is a fast-growing, massive country. Well, Reuters reported this wheel that Brazil's $12 billion iPad deal is in trouble, according to sources. 
And it basically says that the Taiwanese manufacturer, Foxcom, you know, was going to build a massive twelve billion dollar, I guess, plant down there, but the deal hasn't taken off because apparently Foxconn wants tax cuts and various breaks, and I guess the people in Brazil are saying that quote Foxconn is making crazy demands. So you know, I'm not sure how this will impact iPad two uh, availability in the United States. But it would be nice if Apple diversified the iPad 2 production to other parts of the world. What if we're in a trade war with China? How will that affect production? Okay, so in terms of interesting apps to recommend, stylish iPad apps on Tumblr featured an app that I then downloaded and used that's free. That seems pretty good, and it seems to be a sort of a free competitor to Flipboard. So if you're looking for something to sort of, you know, create like a magazine-like feed for RSS news stories, the app is called Every, E-V-R-I for iPad. And um, let's see, it's, it basically says it's a topic-based newsreader. I guess that's how it's differentiated by, by um, um, Flipboard and that it has 2.3 million topics from over 15,000 of the web's best sources. So here, let's take a look at it. Um, here we go. Let me just stop for a second. Okay, so every has a nice cute icon. Um, it's blue with this like E that looks kind of like, you know, um, I don't know, it's a very cool little icon. I like their icon design. So when you open it up, at the top you have different subject matters, and you can swipe left to right, and it gives you some default ones. Um, you've got, well, on the left you've got uh, news feeds from people following you. You can have your Twitter account. I logged into my Twitter account. You also have Facebook login. So, like, if you go look at my Twitter account, um, it takes my Twitter feed, and so these are people that I'm following. I'm, Ma I'm Max Future on Twitter and so for example Veronica has I guess that's Veronica Belmont has her picture of uh, Leo Laporte's um, I guess podcast and uh, you swipe left well you swipe to the right and you get you get the content from people twittering and it's pretty cool I kinda like the layout in some ways I like it better than the flip action in, um, in Flipboard um, so, for example, the next one is from Mashable, and right there it's got the link. Uh, similarly, Josh Topolsky. All right, let's go back. So anyways, but what's nice about it, if you, you, you press the left arrow and you go back, so along the top you have like a little buttons, very simple, different colors for the different topics. So you got uh, top news, you got U.S. and world, and basically when you press the top button, then the topics under that button pop up. Like for example, I clicked US and World, so I got like these different um, icons uh, with tags. For example, saying unemployment, Syria, Rick Perry, Bank of America, Iran, Social Security. And if you're not seeing the video version of this podcast, let me describe it to you. The icons are almost like little Polaroid snapshots sort of layered on top of each other with a little black label and a picture that's associated with the topic. So it's kind of, I kind of like the layout. It's very different than Flipboard. Um, and you can also search, there's a search button. And if you go to settings, you've got accounts. So you can you know add in your Twitter or Facebook accounts. And uh, under general, you can share this app, you can rate this app, and you also have the about, about um, every. And if you swipe, there's just, um, there's a lot of topics. And you also have a history button. And I, I kind of like it. It's all the, um, all the topics are on like what are like a, looks like a wooden board. So look, I mean, this is free. 
and um, it's an RSS feeder and um, social networking feeder and uh, I kind of like it I think this is I think this is very cool so check it out it's called every uh, let's see what it has under technology so I'm not sure though how in this you would create new topics if you wanted to save the topics I haven't really figured out that part uh, if there's a way like in Flipboard you can create new squares and uh, I'm not sure if there's a way to do this with um, every but look check it out and um, experiment with it you have nothing to lose it's free so I recommend it now another app that is free that may be more functional for you particularly if you have an American Express card is an app called Amex for iPad which is free and which came out on October 5th now I have an American Express card so I'm probably definitely going to use this and um, you know it's a very functional app basically you can schedule payments through the app you can check your balance you can view your recent charges and payments you can manage all your card accounts you can view your membership rewards and point balance and you can log in using the same user ID and password you use on American Express um, so it goes on to say though however that American Amex for iPad is only for consumer cards uh, business cards from open and corporate cards issued uh, directly uh, for, so from American Express uh, some of the eligible cards include but are not limited to and it lists a whole bunch of them including American Express green card gold card platinum card centurion card zinc for from American Express blue from American Express clear from American Express it goes on and on and on jet blue Hilton honors starward preferred so you know it's not it's not a bad looking art uh, app it's kind of simple and it makes sense that our financial institutions would have dedicated apps for the iPad particularly if the iPad is replacing computers for a lot of people so it's pretty new um, the reviews so far are generally positive uh, it says some people giving it five stars I don't see any see one once one star but most of the uh, stars are five stars so again it's called Amex for iPad check it out another free app you might want to check out particularly if you travel a lot is hotels.com HD uh, which is a free app and uh, it's for hotel reservations for a hundred thirty five thousand hotels so it you know it doesn't take up that much size it's only 9.4 megabytes and uh, it basically says you can find and securely book your choice of more than 20,000 last-minute deals from a selection of 1400,000 hotels you can explore the interactive skyline with landmarks from around the world on the app homepage you can flick through hotels photos and reviews with one swipe and uh, you can sort and use filter tools and it also has a new shortlist feature so it looks pretty cool and uh, let's see if we can take a screen shot tour of it if you see the video version of this but I'll also describe it okay so the icon is pretty nice for hotels.com HD it's just a, a red icon with a simple lowercase h so I like the simplicity of the icon um, when when you launch it you basically have this kind of cool panoramic of all the cities in the world sort of cr scrunched together and it's scanning like uh, left to right through the skyline imagine all the world's big cities as one big skyline with the water in front of you and it's kind of cool and then there's the little icon letter H above different tall buildings and it's basically it's a sort of a skyline of the world and it's sort of like in 3D it's kind of like old-fashioned 3D with the 
building sort of in front a little bit, the mountains. But look, I'll, I'll click on the H over the Empire State Building, and it'll say Discover Hotels in New York, New York. And um, I click on that, and it gives me a search bar altogether. There's also, I guess, a phone if I wanted to call. And uh, so the default is New York, New York. It gives me uh, the date range. So I'm going to pick, let's say, three nights. And it's, it's, it's actually a very nice layout because the calendar sort of is intuitively built into it and pops down. And then I'm going to, I picked a date in October 26. I'm going to pick three nights. And um, how many rooms do I want? I want one room. Uh, and let's press go and let's see what happens. And so you get the little spinning thing, and then boom, it lays out in sort of vertical tiles, four of them across, different options. So I have uh, one star, the Hotel Riverside Studios, 112 bucks in New York, the, the Latham Hotel for 162 bucks, the Waldorf Astoria for $499 a night, and the Pod Hotel. So... And then you can scroll and you get lots of hotels. So it just gives you a, a wide selection. And I guess it's easy to filter. There's a um, sort button that's easy, best sellers, or you can quickly s shift it to price low to high. So I'm going to do low to high. And, um, and then again, it sort of lays out these tiles. Generally, you can see four hotels at a time, but you can scroll. Um, you can click at the bottom of the tile, the details, and the tile expands and gives you, uh, like here I've got the flat hotel, and um, it gives you much more detail. It gives you pictures. It gives you, um, well, there's tabs at the bottom, the home tab, which gives the, do the location. Then you've got the... Um, the beds button that gives you the different prices for how many beds and then there's something like in the shape of a hair dryer that gives you a little more information about the about the place and then there's a quote button that gives you quotes by people who've reviewed the place and then there's a camera button that just shows you all the pictures for the hotel and then finally a little um, GPS icon that shows you exactly where it is in New York and there's a button that allows you to book now now if I press book now what happens um, let's say I picked a hopefully it doesn't book it through my um, through my uh, iTunes account um, I haven't created an account, and I guess I would create an account through Hotels.com, and that's how I would book. Now, I wonder if Apple takes a 30% cut of the bookings through this app. That would be really interesting. Um, but look, it's kind of it's kind of helpful. It's just a different way uh, to to um, you know book hotels. It's not a bad app. It's free. Uh, it's very easy to sort of scroll and get to your part of the world that you want to like look into. If I, um, it's actually a good way to learn what the the famous buildings are on the world. Like I didn't know what this funky looking building was. I press the H over it, and it's in Dubai, United Arab Emirates. If I press this other button right next to it, it says Discover Hotels in Moscow. Uh, the one thing I don't like is you've got this sort of hanging tab on the right. It would be nice if it popped back, but that gives you the search, the shortlist, and the reservation, and the login button all at once. Um, so, you know, check it out. It's called Hotels.com HD. It's a free app. It's, a, it's kind of, seems like kind of a fun way to look for a hotel. If you use Hotels.com, you should definitely get it. Now, if you're looking to keep your iPad from being stolen when you leave it on your desk, um, it looks like Griffin Technologies has something for you. And, and I read about this on TUAW.com. And apparently Griffin has come up with the TechSafe locking case and cable lock. So basically, it's a special case that allows you to use those standard cable locks, you know, that you see to 
keep uh, computers locked down. And um, basically, it's kind of pricey. It, it costs 80 bucks, $79.99 for the TechSafe locking case and cable. But I guess the trick with the, for this would be to have a case that can't come off um, come off your iPad because that would defeat the whole purpose. Uh, the case slides apart for easy installation, it says here. With the, t with the top frame sliding off at the bottom frame, you drop the iPad 2 into the bottom piece, then slide the frame back on. The result is a very solid case. On the back of the bottom piece are two rectangular bumps. These are the indentations that can be used as a fold-out stand. And uh, they say the, the, the lock is the niftiest part. Um, it makes it, they, they basically say Griffin has created a hardened steel lock blade that slides into the small opening in the hinge area between the screen and keyboard of the MacBook Air. Oh, I guess they have one for the MacBook Air too. Um, but anyways, it looks like an interesting, if you, you know, there aren't really a lot of devices that um, are made to lock down your iPad too. So it looks like Griffin has come out with something if you need that. I mean, I personally make sure that I take my iPad 2 with me or I lock my office so that uh, nobody can get at it. But you might not have that choice, so check it out. Okay, so if you're looking for a somewhat good educational app, we've seen a number of them come out. Uh, one of the more recent ones that I guess came out September 22nd of this year is called Back in Time. It costs eight dollars, but it seems kind of cool if you've got a youngster and you're trying to teach them stuff. And it says here that it's the number one iPad paid book app in the United States, United Kingdom, and 26 other countries. And so, what does it do? It basically takes you. It says on an imaginary clock, uh, which will guide you through this quest. Uh, it'll take you through defining moments in the history of humankind of life and the universe itself. You'll go back in time in an interactive multimedia journey through those mo moments. Now, I've always been intrigued by that because it it kind of blows me away, like the history of the Earth. Like, for example, the Earth is five billion years old, yet life of any kind didn't really start creeping out of the mud until about 500 million years ago. So think about that. like. You know, it, it you know only one tenth of the whole history of the Earth has any sort of life, and then you know mankind, modern man's only like you know in the last I don't know twenty thousand, thirty thousand years. So this seems kind of cool. This app it looks like it has nice graphics and video and um, text defining. For example, one sample here is about the advent of the insects. So it's sort of like a, it has graphics on the insects and where they came from. It has another um, page is about the KT, KT extinction. This is when uh, the dinosaurs maybe became extinct when uh, a big asteroid hit the Earth. So, you know, look, when I was a kid, there'd be these like science uh, tabletop books with beautiful pictures and writing and you would learn a lot about the way the earth and you know the history of our earth you know went by and it sounds like the iPad is becoming that vehicle now with interactive stuff um, so it says here that there's over 300 images 60 plus animations and videos 40 plus illustrated timelines and um, 200 little known interesting facts and there's music too so look it's eight bucks on the other hand you know compared to school books this is expensive so you might want to check it out it's called back in time okay i want to thank you for listening to the ipad podcast uh, again this has been a kind of a sad week with the passing of steve jobs um, and really he had such a profound influence on all of us, really, particularly anybody listening to this podcast probably has an iPad, is thinking about getting an iPad, and probably has some other Apple devices. 
And um, we really owe it to Steve Jobs, who founded, who created Apple with Steve Wozniak for, you know, having that drive and ambition to forward the world. And I think that's what he did. He forwarded the world by giving us these fantastic devices and, and products. I mean, I would not be able to do this podcast if he hadn't really pushed forward computing and technology and really the ori I mean the the able the ability to do creative stuff really was first pioneered I think on Apple products before even Windows products um, so anyways here's to you Steve we really miss you uh, I know I, I know I'm always going to be wondering what more could you have you know put on given us uh, Apple customers if you had lived longer and um, you know our hearts go out to your family your kids your loved ones and Steve uh, I guess you'll always be you know around us as long as we're you know using Apple products all right so thanks for listening and see you next week This has been a Max Future Production.